Well, this is the reason that I am with the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. Many years ago, I came from San Diego with my husband and we bought the oldest hotel in Yuma. And the name of that hotel was the Hotel Robert E. Lee. It was a riot. So that's what brought us to Yuma. And one morning, really early, the city manager, a woman named Joyce Wilson, was pounding on the door. So I came downstairs to answer the door in my bathrobe. And she said, I've heard you're getting ready to leave Yuma. So Joyce Wilson said, said to me, what do you need then if, you can, if I can get you to stay? I said, well, probably need a job. What can you do? I said, I'm an archeologist and a historian from San Diego's Gas Lamp District. And she said, you're hired, you're our city archeologist. So for over 25 years, I have been the city's archeologist and historian tasked to the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area. And it has been one of the greatest joys of my life. What I noticed in Yuma is that they weren't taking advantage of grants. There was just no grant writing. Um, and I knew she was available. And I said, can you write grants? And she had never done it. And Charlie, my new boss, said, can you write? And I went, well, I've just written a master's thesis. And yes, yes, I can write. When I got here, the Ocean Ocean Bridge was closed because of structural deficiencies. She was able to get a million dollars in grants. We needed to get another 400,000 of local funding. So in partnership with the Quetzon Tribe and the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, with the uh, also blessing of the, the city of Yuma. I remember February of 2002, uh, we had a great celebration on the, uh, on the bridge uh, and it was really a coming together of both communities and that actually set the tone for us collaborating on the East Wetlands because the Quetzan own more than two-thirds of the East Wetlands so they were a critical partner if anything was going to happen there. We really envisioned multiple different um, uses of the river. You know, there are two riverfront parks, Gateway and West Wetlands, and then commercial development downtown. But I'd say the largest undertaking, far and away, was the Yuma East Wetlands. There were a number of grant applications that had to be done to put this in, uh, all these plans in motion, right? We had that funding. And Tina just brought, you know, her, her passion, her flair for the history, and, and she was really able to reach people that would review these grants, you know, more on a, a personal level. And it was easy to write it, to say, we're doing something so exciting and so full of joy for the community. Tina kept pestering me about this guy she heard about up in, uh, up in Parker, who was doing a, a restoration a similar size restoration. And I thought, you know, this is gonna take forever. I'll just put this on the back burner. One day I rented a city van, put the heritage area people in it. We went and met Fred and the rest was history. So the first time I came, you know, parked in this abandoned parking lot, hiked through this non-native thicket of a jungle, got chased by dogs, was scared for my life. You know, the police didn't even like to go down there, like nobody. So fast forward, you know, 22 years later, and I drive to this place that was an abandoned parking lot. I stayed a 
beautiful hotel. I have a wonderful meal. And then I walk out and instead of fearing for my life, I walk through, you know, 350 acres of beautiful wetlands with diverse plants, with native, you know, spe endangered species that hadn't been there in decades. You know, I see kids, uh, cross country meets happening. I see people taking their prom pictures. You know, I see 40 different species of birds on a two hour walk. I watched a gorgeous sunset. 10 years later and $10 million worth of grants that she helped write and totally transformed it. During the fiscal crisis in 2009, uh, the state announced that they were gonna close both state parks. The exhibits were, oh, probably uh, er, vintage early 1980s, and they had not changed in 30 years. It was a dying entity, that museum. What did it need? It needed a facelift. And I had to pinch myself that I was the one that got to do it. We closed the, the museum to the public, and I had basically six or seven days a week to go case by case and re-engineer the story of the Yuma Territorial Prison. Usually museum design takes years and, and let alone construction. But I remember uh, T and I walking in in April of 2010 and her looking at the space. And again, this is, the, this is her genius of interior design. She looked at the space and said, the ceiling's too high. So we're gonna put in oversized molding and we're gonna paint it a certain way and it'll bring the ceiling down. And then she said, we gotta fill up the space. We, you know, we, we did those gigantic graphics of the prison from way back when. We did those banners, uh, gigantic banners of different prisoners. And it filled the space up all of a sudden. Yeah, when Tina came in, some of the things she did, she re relined all the showcases. Got all new pictures, all new wording. She chopped these cases in half so we could have more display. The budget was so minimal that I don't know how she did it on that minimal budget, especially the quality that we still have today. But there's a lot of people, they say this is one of the best museums they've been to. The Colorado River State Historic Park needed tender loving care. It needed better exhibits. It needed a, really a flow that would open that park up to the public. It was not well advertised, by the way. It was kind of a secret museum. Tina definitely has a lot of creativity and has that design eye that she has brought to a number of exhibits that she has been involved with developing at the park, including um, one, of our, one of our best exhibits, which is what we call the Siphon Room. And this exhibit includes this giant photo of the siphon tunnel before it was filled with water. And it's such a fantastic exhibit and we include it in a lot of our brochures that a lot of people come to the park and they want to walk through that tunnel. And we have to tell them, no, actually the uh, siphon is still in use. It's still full of water. The whole idea is to tell the story in a very succinct way so that people get it. And that's what I think we're, we've been able to do. We pared out some of the artifacts and put them in proper places. So when the pivot point area was developed next to what is today the, the Hilton Hotel, um, the steam locomotive was actually transported from its park location over to Madison Avenue, where the original railroad tracks came into Yuma. And that really enhanced that interpretive area. I said to Tina, you know, how we, who, who can relocate and restore a locomotive? Within a day, she had tracked somebody down uh, that could do it. Um, 
And it's not an easy thing to move a 110 ton train and restore it. And we had a series of panels to talk about different parts of the crossing and the railroad history. And um, so she was very involved in finding the photographs and helping write the, the, um, you know, the text for those panels. So what a project. I mean, it turned out great. So now you want to talk about railroad history, you can go to the actual site where the first train entered Yuma. When I first arrived here uh, working for the Arizona Historical Society at the Sanguinetti House Museum, this sweet museum in all of its charm was sadly in a state of disrepair. And one of the first things that Tina did was revealed the most beautiful old windows and doors here at the Sanguinetti House, drawing in natural light for the first time in many years. That helped to bring life into this museum. One of my favorite rooms in the home is the room we call the chocolate shop today. It displays a beautiful mural, colorized mural, of E.F. Sanguinetti lovingly looking at his daughter, Rose Marie, and standing in his rose gardens with his wife, Lila. Tina saw that photograph, and she decided it belongs boldly presented in the home. What that initial burst of effort did was really trigger a community coming together. She adopted this uh, Episcopal church, which was, you know, could have been lost to Yuma history. And she restored it and utilized it. And many a family, uh, many a group enjoyed uh, a dinner there. And there were wedding receptions. She brought it back to life, just like she helped bring a lot of the downtown riverfront back to life. The Yuma Plain, that was again working with a group of volunteers that had a bunch of information that needed a home, right? So, so Tina was part of, of helping them find a home and then, and then working you know, with the history and work, working with them and the city to sort of bridge that gap between these volunteer people that are passionate about their project and then being able to get that house there. She's opened her kitchen to cooking classes. She likes to share her love of cooking with others. She's helped to pass down recipes from early Yuma families onto new generations. You know, I mean, Tina's presence within the heritage area, you know, with the staff and the people of Yuma and, and all the contractors, myself included, you know, just the spirit that Tina brought to all of this, you know, this can-do spirit and we can do it and this is gonna be amazing. Tina has a an amazing gift of positivity. And she would look at me when I would come to her in my early, perhaps naive years here at the Sanguinetti House with an idea. And she looked in my eyes when I asked her about the possibility of making an idea come to life. And she should pause for a minute and then she'd say, do it, do it. She was such an inspiration in my career here. And a sense of community pride is what I took away from being part of the National Heritage Area. It was a dream to come together with a team and we all had the same focus. Let's do creative work and we won't be here forever, but we can leave behind really some magic. You know, I'll be in my rocker someday and we'll say, what a dream it was.